We are just days away from Northrop unveiling the B-21 Raider, America's new stealth bomber. And it carries the namesake of the legendary Doolittle Raiders of World War II. The true story of Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle and his Raiders is crazy and might seem like the stuff of legend, but when it comes to Doolittle's raid, the truth is stranger and more exciting than fiction. Let's dive into this. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Earlier this week, I had the chance to sit down with Preston Stewart for an interview on his channel about Russia's air warfare doctrine and how it's been failing in Ukraine. If you're interested, I really recommend you check out his channel. I think that interview will go up the same day as this video. But now, let's talk about the B-21 Raider, set to be unveiled in just a few days. As a lot of you know, I was jockeying for an invite to this event, but I got turned down by Northrop's team. I don't take it personally. I wasn't the only one. Security for this event is apparently very strict. I've spoken to journalists from big mainstream outlets all the way down to small independent ones, and the few teams that are getting to go to this event are seeing restrictions all the way down to what types of lenses they can have on their cameras. So I'll be watching the live stream just like many of you, and you better believe I'll have some things to say about it once it's all said and done. But today, I want to focus on the history behind the Raiders' name. Just weeks after the attack on Pearl Harbor nearly crippled America's Pacific Fleet, the Doolittle Raid saw American bombers striking targets in Tokyo and mainland Japan, which had far-reaching implications both in terms of strategic effect and, importantly, in terms of morale within the United States. And while the overall strategic implications of Doolittle's raid may occasionally be overstated, the way their tale encapsulates America's fighting spirit really can't be. Doolittle's raiders did the impossible, with little expectation of survival, and with the understanding that their efforts, even if totally successful, might do little to change the broader course of the war. So why would they do it? Well, because someone had given their country a serious black eye, and they wanted to return the favor. But let's take a step back and start at the beginning, because on December 7th, 1941, Japanese forces attacked America's Pacific Fleet moored in Pearl Harbor. The surprise offensive killed 2,400 American service members, took 18 warships out of the fight, and nearly crippled America's offensive power projection in the Pacific. To that point, the U.S. had remained somewhat neutral in the globe-spanning conflict, providing support to the Allied effort through more covert than overt means. This surprise attack on Pearl Harbor ended any such pretense. Within weeks, the U.S. was already formulating what defense officials dubbed the Joint Army-Navy Bombing Project. Importantly, the Air Force didn't exist yet. The idea was simple. Japan had bombed the U.S., and Uncle Sam wanted to return the favor, aiming for Japanese industrial centers with the goal of inflicting both, quote, material and psychological damage. In other words, they wanted to undermine Japan's faith in its leadership. But striking back at Japan wasn't just about affecting Japanese perceptions of the war. It was also very much about strengthening American resolve. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, Americans suddenly felt very vulnerable. And with the Pacific Fleet in disarray, that vulnerability was quickly turning into fear. America's military needed a way to shift momentum in their favor and to prove to the American people that the U.S. wasn't losing a war that they'd only just entered. But there was one big problem. There wasn't a single bomber in the American arsenal with enough range to make it happen. And to make matters even worse, Japan knew that. The man who would ultimately solve this dilemma was Jimmy Doolittle, who started flying for the U.S. Army all the way back in 1917, just eight years after the U.S. took delivery on the world's first military aircraft, the Wright Military Flyer, which was from none other than the Wright brothers themselves. By 1922, Doolittle became the first person to fly across the United States in under 24 hours, something he accomplished in an Airco DH-4 biplane. 
Shortly after, the Army sent him off to MIT, where he earned his master's degree and then a PhD in aeronautical engineering. Doolittle got out of the Army in 1930 to pursue a private sector career, but then fighting kicked off in Europe again, and he could see the writing on the wall. He re-entered service in 1940, a year after the fighting kicked off and a year before America would be thrust into it. So when the War Department needed to find a way to do the seemingly impossible, General Henry H. Hap Arnold, a man who'd go on to become the first general of the Air Force, knew Doolittle was the man for the job. Now, Japan's defensive perimeter stretched too far out to sea for America's carrier-based aircraft to launch combat sorties, and there were no friendly airstrips close enough to the Japanese mainland to launch the Army's bombers from. So the War Department chose to combine these two approaches and find a way to launch bombers directly from the deck of their carriers. But, as you might guess, that was a lot easier said than done. The mission called for an aircraft with a range of at least 2,400 miles and enough payload capacity to carry at least 2,000 pounds of bombs, while still also being small enough to cram a number of them on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. Doolittle investigated using the Douglas B-23 Dragon, but its large wingspan made it poorly suited for carrier duty. So then he checked the Martin B-26 Marauder, but its takeoff characteristics were just too dangerous for carrier duty as well. There wasn't a single platform in the American arsenal that fit the bill, so Doolittle and co. decided to make one. Of course, there wasn't time to start from scratch, so they decided to use the North American B-25 Mitchell, America's newest bomber. It made its maiden flight in August of 1940 and only entered service in 1941. By the time Doolittle set his sights on the B-25, it had not even flown a single combat mission. And to be clear, there was a lot of work to do. The B-25B had a range of just 1,300 miles and minimal self-defense capabilities offered by two machine guns in the top turret, two in a belly turret, and one in the bombardier's nose. With no rear-facing guns, the B-25 was completely vulnerable to attack from behind, and to make matters worse, the nature of their mission meant that they would have no fighter escorts all along the way. But despite the B-25's shortcomings, this choice of bomber was supported by Navy Captain Francis Lowe, who had taken it upon himself to load two B-25s, each with a pilot and co-pilot, onto the Navy's newest aircraft carrier, the USS Hornet, for testing. Both bombers took off from the flat top without any difficulty, but by Lowe's own admission, landing again would be a completely different story. So, work commenced on modifying a fleet of 24 B-25s for the job, with the ultimate goal of fielding 20 of them in the final mission. First, a collapsible fuel tank and a number of additional fuel cells were all crammed into the fuselage all around the bomb bay. This just about doubled the total fuel capacity to better than 1,100 gallons. Despite the Mitchell's limited defensive capabilities, they yanked the belly turret out to save weight, as well as the tactical radio, but they did add a fake gun to the tail of the bomber, hoping that it might dissuade Japanese fighters from approaching straight from the rear. The carburetors on all the engines were tuned to offer the best fuel efficiency at low altitudes, and as America's newest bomber, the B-25 came equipped with the then-top-secret Norden bomb sites, but Doolittle had them all ripped out partly out of concern that they might fall into enemy hands if they got shot down, but also because of their poor performance at the low altitudes they'd be operating at. In their place, a simple bomb site dubbed the Mark Twain was invented by Captain Charles Ross Greening and manufactured for just about 20 cents a piece in the sheet metal shops of Eglin Airfield, which today is Eglin Air Force Base. Doolittle chose the 17th Bombardment Group out of Pendleton Field to source his crews. They were the first to receive this new bomber, and that meant that they were the most experienced with it. The crews and their support personnel were all transferred under the pretense that they'd be conducting anti-submarine patrols off the East Coast, with only the group commander knowing the real reason for their order. Once the 17th BG were on site in Columbia, South Carolina, Doolittle arrived and addressed the crowd, telling them that he was looking for volunteers for a highly dangerous secret mission that would help the American war effort, and nothing else. Every airman present volunteered. So Doolittle and the squadron commanders set about selecting the most capable 24 crews. 
For the next three weeks, these crews trained on simulated carrier takeoffs, low-level flying, night navigation, low-level bombing, and more. But thanks to bad weather, they only actually got about 50 total hours of flight time before it was time to execute. Doolittle reported that his group of volunteers had achieved safe operational levels of capability, but the truth was, there was nothing safe about the mission they were about to embark on. On April 2nd, 1942, just about four months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Doolittle and his raiders climbed aboard the USS Hornet with 16 of their B-25s squeezed onto the flight deck. All of the carrier's fighters had to be stored below deck to allow room for the bombers, and the bombers themselves had to be placed on the deck in order that they'd take off. By April 18th, they'd rendezvoused with the USS Enterprise, another carrier that was tasked with providing them with protection, since they couldn't launch their own fighters if they needed to. The plan was to launch the bombers about 400 miles out from the Japanese coast, and because landing those bombers on the carriers again was a lost cause, the U.S. first tried to negotiate a deal that would let them land in the Soviet Union by giving up those B-25s to the Soviets as a part of the Lend-Lease Act. The Soviet Union had a non-aggression agreement with the Japanese at the time, so they refused. But China stepped up, offering five potential landing locations for bombers so that they could refuel and carry on towards friendly territory. But at 5.58 a.m. on April 18th, about 750 miles from Japan, the two carriers and their accompanying vessels were spotted by a Japanese patrol boat. The USS Nashville, a Brooklyn-class cruiser, swung into action and took that patrol boat out, but not before they'd had a chance to radio in a warning. With the possibility that the element of surprise may be waning, Doolittle and the commander of the Hornet, Captain Mark Mitcher, made a decision. They'd launch their bombers now, 10 hours early, and 250 miles further out than intended, which meant they almost certainly wouldn't have enough fuel to accomplish the mission and get to a friendly airstrip. The first B-25 took off at 0820, and by 0919, all 16 were in the air. It was the first time any of those crews had ever taken off from an aircraft carrier. They flew for six hours at wave top level until they reached Japan at right around noon local time. From there, they climbed to about 1,500 feet to commence their bombing runs against military and industrial targets in Tokyo and five other cities. Japanese forces were taken almost entirely by surprise. The bombers were engaged by some light anti-aircraft fire at first, as Japan rushed to get fighters into the air. One of the B-25s, piloted by First Lieutenant Richard O. Joyce, took anti-aircraft fire, but the damage was pretty light. Then another, piloted by First Lieutenant Everett Holstrom, found itself under attack from the first wave of Japanese fighters. Its gun turret malfunctioned, and the crew was forced to jettison its bombs early to make a break for it. But the Japanese defenses were weak this deep into their home turf, and the bombers weren't going down without a fight. As Japanese KI-45s and KI-61s closed in, a turret gunner inside 1st Lieutenant Harold Watson's whirling dervish B-25 scored the Americans' first kill. Soon, two more Japanese fighters were downed at the hands of turret gunners from the Harry Carrier, piloted by 1st Lieutenant Ross Greening. B-25 crews used their nose turrets to strafe additional military targets after they expended their payloads, creating mayhem on the ground. Japan had plunged America into this war, but now America had brought it home to Japan. Their mission was accomplished, and Doolittle's raiders set out for the friendly airstrips of China. But their hardships were just beginning. With their bomb bays empty, 15 of the bombers turned southwest across the East China Sea, headed for friendly territory. But the last, piloted by Captain Edward York, did not have the fuel to make the attempt. It was later found that the aircraft's carburetors had been readjusted by civilian technicians, reducing their fuel efficiency and costing the crew desperately needed range. York turned his B-25 towards Soviet Vladivostok, despite the Soviet Union's refusal to allow American bombers to land. Although they had friendly ties with the U.S. at the time, the Soviets were concerned about Japanese reprisal, so they took the bomber and its crew into custody. But York and his crew were later allowed to escape through Iran with help from the Soviet secret police. The other 15 crews had even greater challenges ahead. Due to the early launch, all of the bombers were running low on fuel as night fell over the East China Sea. 
A tailwind had allowed them to get further than they thought, but ultimately they were all forced to bail out of their aircraft either over water or along the coast, or attempt to crash land them. A race was on. The Chinese and even Soviet fighters were scouring the coastline for Doolittle's raiders, hoping to find them before the thousands of Japanese troops in the area could. Over the next few days, 69 of Doolittle's raiders were recovered alive by friendly forces. Two were confirmed to have drowned in their aircraft, and another had died in the effort to bail out. Japanese forces captured eight of Doolittle's men, three of whom were executed in short order while a fourth died in custody. The remaining four would remain in prison until August of 1945 when they were rescued by the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA. Now today, Japan is a valued ally and China is America's primary competitor on the world stage, but it's important that we do remember that as many as 250,000 Chinese men, women, and children were killed in reprisals for helping the Americans escape. With all of his aircraft lost, either in crashes or to the Soviets, and many of his 80 raiders missing or captured, Doolittle believed his daring plan had ended in utter failure. Their bombing mission had indeed damaged Japan's industrial base, but the damage itself was somewhat negligible. He returned to the United States believing he was going to be court-martialed, but instead found a hero's welcome. While it would take time for the strategic effect of this mission to manifest, there was an immediate effect on American morale. After months of anxiety and fear gripping the nation, Doolittle's raiders had done the seemingly impossible, and their incredible courage in the face of overwhelming odds was exactly what the nation needed at the moment. Just 10 days before Doolittle's raid, America had suffered its worst defeat yet, with 12,000 Americans and 65,000 Filipino soldiers surrendering to the Japanese in Bataan. Newspapers and radio broadcasts around the country erupted with headlines like U.S. bombs Tokyo, and for a brief moment, Americans breathed a sigh of relief. It was the first time since the 13th century that any foreign power had attacked the Japanese mainland. It punctured the myth of their invulnerability. It was a small shift in momentum, but one that quickly grew with subsequent victories. President Roosevelt awarded Doolittle the Medal of Honor and promoted him to Brigadier General, and all 80 of his raiders, alive or dead, were awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for their service. The story of Doolittle's raiders is a valuable reminder of how awful war truly is, but also of the incredible things that people can accomplish when they place the safety, the security, and the sovereignty of their nation over their own well-being. Doolittle's raiders showed the world what just 80 Americans and 16 aircraft could do, and forced them to take a step back and wonder what all the rest might be capable of as well. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.